Great, thank you, Danielle. Uh, I want to welcome everyone who um, is with us today and uh, either in YouTube land or um, uh, here in our committee hearing. Um, we're going to be discussing one of, I think, our committee's favorite topics uh, this morning, which is um, hearing from uh, a small group of communication union districts that um, are in different stages of development in different parts of Vermont. Um, this, uh, uh, we've got um, Ann Manwaring, who's here representing the Deerfield uh, Valley <coughs> Communications Union District. We've got Christine Hulquist, who's representing um, NEK Broadband. And we've got FX Flynn, who is representing EC Fiber. Um, we've been spending a little time uh, in uh, certainly in the last two years, working on CUD issues. Um, most recently, this uh, earlier this summer in June, this committee um, supported uh, some appropriations that went through the Coronavirus Relief Fund program, um, and interested to talk with some of our guests about that this morning. Uh, yesterday, we sent our recommendations off to the House Appropriations Committee. That's going to be a continuing discussion uh, in, in the coming weeks. Um, we made a recommendation of uh, $3 million um, divided between two different programs um, that would specifically go to support um, CUDs, uh, you know, as the, um, as the evolution continues um, uh, toward stringing fiber and supporting um, customers in your catchment areas that uh, desperately need better connectivity. Um, so, um, with our three guests this morning, uh, they are listed on our agenda. Um, I want to change up the order just a little bit. And that I would like to hear from um, Anne and Christine first, because the CUDs that they're representing are newer in their phase of evolution. And um, that's of particular interest to our committee. And um, then we'll um, turn to FX, um, EC Fiber, which I'm familiar with because uh, I'm a customer of EC Fiber in Thetford um, has been around for over a decade now um, and interested to draw on FX and the work that um, EC Fiber has done, you know, kind of going down this path of, of evolution and serving customers directly. So um, again, wanna welcome our guests and uh, turn to Ann first um, uh, to hear from you. And just um, what I want to let our guests know is we're pretty informal in this committee with the exception of our blue digital hands, which people put up if they've got a question. So um, if you wanna share your testimony with us and we'll take a few questions. And then after all, we've heard from all three of you, we'll probably have a little more general conversation in the committee. So welcome, Ann, it's good to see your face again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Tim, and welcome to, I'm glad to be with all of you again. Uh, for the record, um, I am Ann Manwaring. I'm the chair of the Deerfield Valley Communication Union District. Um, we are 15 towns in Wyndham and Bennington counties on the southern border of Vermont. We're one of nine CUDs. And I've uh, kind of organized my testimony in bullet points, not a straight out narrative. So um, when you hear it, I don't know if you'll hear going from bullet point to bullet point, but um, it won't be uh, as uh, uh, knit together as if I had written it as a narrative. But we are at the point, I think, where um, we're ready for some more specific things. And that's what I've tried to put in my uh, comments today. So if, um, in a just a general sense, um, we are now nine CUDs, most of which have been formed this year, building on the success of the original EC Fiber. Thousands upon thousands of volunteer hours of our community members have gone into this endeavor. That so much has been achieved in such a short time is testimony to the need. Expectations are high for universal access to high speed. The job of the state now is to do all in its power to sustain and strengthen the work needed to accomplish the rollout of fiber to the nearly 70,000 um, unserved or underserved homes and business in the shortest possible time. The Vermont Public Service Department has estimated the cost of the infrastructure needed to be around 293 million from all sources. 
the governor's budget proposed two, and I have now seen your revised version to them, uh, Tim. So I hadn't seen it when I wrote this. Two million should go only to CUDs or CUDs in public private partnerships. The primary use of this is to uh, is for the 10% match to unlock up to $4 million in VITA loans to a CUD. Um, the 10 million VITA loans available is enough to begin infrastructure work for two to three CUDs. Um, the state must recognize that while CUDs have been created as municipal organizations, subject to all the laws that govern municipalities, including open meeting laws, um, the need for RFPs, CUDs, unlike all other municipalities, operate in a market economy, subject to the rules of that market economy. The legislature should find a way to level the playing field with our private sector competitors, including but not limited to modifying open meeting laws, targeting, targeting laws and regulations to benefit us, finding resources that can be used to unlock yet other resources. Once the infrastructure is built and CUDs have become stable entities, there will be an, one ongoing need for further public investment, and that is to find a way to subsidize rates for eligible subscribers. This is important for true universal service, but also because private providers do not have to carry subsidy costs in their profit and loss statements. Below are several uh, specific suggestions from quite a number of different conversations I've been having. Uh, some may be possible for legislative action this session. Some may be, need to be developed for consideration um, in, in January when you come back. Um, they are organized in a couple of different categories and I'll just, I, I won't read them all to you because I will uh, have these to you in writing. But the first is about VITA loans and the ability to make uh, access to those loans um, more real in, in light of the scope of the work that we all have to do. Um, and there's quite a number of suggestions there. Uh, for example, uh, allow uh, CUDs to be able to use in-kind contributions to, for the 10% match. That's an example. Um, uh, second and next is a category uh, that's related to the CARES Act money the money that needs to be spent very soon. Um, and that is to um, basically uh, issues around targeting any money that is brought, is clawed back from uh, grants that were given to private entities go only to CUDs. Um, and also to be sure that there is clear, clear accountability for the uh, work that is being done uh, by the private providers to expense, extend their reach, which is while we all recognize the need for it, it is coming at a significant cost uh, to the CUD uh, effort. Uh, the next category has to do with the connectivity and issues, um, the universal service fund, which is ongoing money. Um, and so we would uh, suggest again that you target all of the of that to CUDs, at least for the period of time until we become viable entities. Um, and that eventually the requirements for service under that fund move from the 25-3 up to 100-100 so that we acknowledge um, what, what the realities are of fiber. And then the, the next and the last category uh, is, has to do with poll collection and that's, again, uh, a significant amount of work. It is sort of the first step in rolling out the uh, infrastructure. Um, and, and one suggestion is, for example, that the state might fund poll collection uh, yeah. work and, and give it uh, out to uh, uh, as interest-free loans to be paid back in five years. Uh, this is to CUDs when revenue streams are sufficient, for example. Um, and to perhaps standardize the methods used to collect poll data and how it is maintained. So there's a, a whole a series of very specific um, uh, ideas that you may be able to roll into some legislation. That's what I understood you were looking for. And um, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.
No, thank you, Ann. That was helpful. Um, and, and again, it would be great to have um, your testimony uh, to, to Danielle, and we'll have that um, just so we can refer to it. Um, I've, I've got a very broad uh, question. And then one thing that you touched on that um, I want to highlight, I won't say it's a new issue to me, but it's not one that I think has been necessarily highlighted for this committee as, um, as a challenge that CUDs face, and maybe an issue that we unpack you know, maybe in the near term, uh, maybe it's next session. But um, first, just very generally speaking, with uh, with now, uh, I guess it's nine CUDs that have been organized um, around Vermont. My understanding is that there is um, an association of those CUDs that's meeting. Um, yeah. That the that the Department of Public Service is supporting uh, some of that work, and um, I just wanted to hear about how that organization is whether coordinating work or sharing best practices, or um, if you could just give us a little background on how CUDs, even though you're focused on one area, are working together. Yes, thank you. Uh, we do have, which we are now euphemistically calling ourselves VCUDA. You will hear a lot more about us. That's the okay. Communication Union District Association. Okay. Uh, we are Five of the CUDs are created into this Vicuda organization via a, a contractual agreement. And we are now in the process of uh, doing some of the organizational work that is needed to actually make us a real organization. We're not registered with the Secretary of State yet or any of those other things. We don't have bylaws yet, but we are working on all of that. Uh, it too is gonna need some administrative support as are all of our CDs. CUDs rather. Uh, <clears throat> and so all of the other newer CUDs that have come online since the first, the original five of us created Vicuda, um, <clears throat> we're, we're also uh, establishing a framework for having them all join us. But in a practical sense, <clears throat> we've been meeting every Monday or every Thursday morning under the uh, august leadership of FX. Thank you, FX. <laughs> Uh, who was instrumental in getting us started, um, and and all of the, all of us and all of the CDs are participating in those conversations. So while we are not totally organized yet with all the CDs in it, we are functionally very much organized um, and have participation on on behalf of all of the CUDs. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah that's helpful. And you know, my my hope is that um, I mean, understanding that the solutions to supporting the connectivity needs of Vermonters is going to be different in different parts of the state. My hope is that, um, that there are best practices developing so that, you know, as even more CUDs develop, um, we won't be recreating the wheel, uh, you know, with every new CUD that starts up that, uh, you know, it's, I'm sure it's not, it won't be as simple as there's a cookbook we can pull off the shelf, but my hope is that, um, you know, by, uh, the different CUDs working together that we can, um, you know, we can, you can, uh, create, um, you know, a, a smoother path to, to evolution. Um, so thanks for that background. And, and again, Christine and FX, I'll be interested in, in your thoughts about that work, you know, as we get to you on the agenda. The other question I had for you, something you flagged in your testimony that is not something we've talked much about um, in this committee, but which I have heard drips and drabs about in recent months, which is um, questions about open meeting laws. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm a, certainly a big supporter of uh, transparency in government. Um, my sense is that there are challenges that CUDs face as public entities, as well, you're formally, you're, you're um, a municipality, um, but you are also in effect in competition with other private providers of telecom services. And as you kind of lay out your plans and customers that you're going to serve, um, potentially, and this is my question for you, you know, the challenges that that may present as you stand up your business model um, and your, you know, potentially your competitors um, see into the work you're doing. But I wasn't sure if that's what you were referring to when you, um, you know, mentioned open meeting law issues, but if that's something you can expound upon, and I'd love to hear from Christine and FX about that when we get to them. 
the essential uh, policy uh, understanding that is required is the fact that even though we are municipalities, we are the only municipality that is operates in an open market system. And so the uh, focus that I was putting in my testimony about leveling the playing field to overcome um, some of the advantages that the private providers have had, um, which obviously have not delivered broadband to all of us and will not, and will not. They may continue to shrink the field, but they will never get to all of us. CUDs can get to all of us, but we will require um, the framework that you folks creed in your legislative processes to have a specific agenda of uh, favoring CUDs at least until a point in history when we become viable operating ent entities all over the state. Whether one of those elements could possibly be uh, the ability to allow us to um, do our business in private as the private entities do. And, and there's mixed feelings in, our, in the Vicuda organization about whether or not we should stay public and go private. Um, but it, it is a problem. Uh, there's only so much you can do uh, in, an, in an executive session in a public framework. And right now we are having, we're taking some looks at our uh, beginning uh, first draft of our business plan. And there's some real questions about whether that business plan should be open to the public and all of our competitors to see it. The open meeting laws that govern us say, this is a public document. And so how to manage that in a way is a real, is a real issue. So the issue isn't just open meeting laws, it's um, if you could find a way to uh, ameliorate that, that would be great. The real issue is uh, a, a range of uh, things that will actually uh, benefit or favor the CUD's operating uh, framework as we go forward, or not just our funding framework. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you, Ann. Um, uh, I've got one hand up. Uh, Representative Campbell, Scott, you want to go ahead? Yes, I was just wondering, thank you. I was just wondering uh, who the five CUDs that are starting the Vicuda organization are. Oh, you're testing my memory, which is getting poor every, <laughs> <day>, every year. <laughs> um, it was uh, EC Fiverr, obviously, Deerfield Valley, uh, the Southern Vermont one, um, CV Fiber, and NEK. Right. Uh, the usual suspects and what I thought, but I just wanted to get <laughs> Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Laura. Good morning, and thank you for being here. A quick question on um, with regard to with regards to the um, open meeting. So, uh, when you all, I know that the CUDs. I know your CUD. I presume most CUDs are talking with um, the existing providers. Um, and are they telling you what their plans are for the for your region? Um, are they uh, sharing with you where they're at um, and and uh, their plans for moving forward? I mean, how is that dynamic uh, playing out? Okay, um, we've had contact in two ways with that. One of the first things that we undertook inside our CUD was that we organized. Uh, um, sessions with oh, eight or nine different potential vendors, which turned out to have been an extraordinarily good learning experience for us about the landscape that was in front of us. It's helped us enormously. And so uh, the extent to which they thought that we might be their customer, we learned a lot about what was going on inside of them. What their overall organizational goals were, we don't know. The other place where we now know uh, very specifically inside our CUD is the list of addresses that the connectivity money is going to permit private providers to expand their services inside our districts. We have street addresses and we can see exactly where they're going and whether or not where they're going has eligible um, students, for example, at those uh, addresses or along that road or not. They don't all. So there's those two ways uh, are 
the only ways right now that we have access into the inner workings of our competitors. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. Mark, did you have your hand up? <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, hi, Ann. Uh, Mark. Hi, Mark, how are you? Good. Hey, um, thanks for being here. This is gonna be a question for, for um, all you folks that are here from representing the CUDs, but um, in your business plan, how are you going about identifying potential customers? Because I'm sure that must be a huge part of whether or not a business plan is viable, right? So, yes. so how, how is that happening? Well, the, the business plan, we just saw the first draft of it a few days ago, so I haven't wrapped my head into it completely at this point. But it, uh, basically, it's by uh, street addresses, uh, roads, as we roll out our fiber. Um, and we have some assumptions built into that about how many addresses, um, they're called passings in the technology of the world, that we have to have in order to have a viable economic model. And there's an assumption about the percentage of those passings, which are, are likely to actually subscribe to our service. And managing those uh, two numbers as we actually spend our money to build out the infrastructure is how we get at what I think that your question is. We don't identify so specifically as people, but. Okay, so there's not an actual survey that goes out to that that uh, street or whatever that says, no. you know, how many of you, but okay. Well, well that, the fiber must... is going by everybody's house. Right, yeah. Okay, thanks. It, it, that was a question I had too, Ann. Th thanks for, uh, Mark had brought this up yesterday. Um, you know, my recollection is 10 years ago, and this was the very early days of EC Fiber at town meeting um, we just, you know, took the opportunity of having whatever 300 people from Thetford in a room uh, and people filled out surveys as to, um, you know, what their current telecom services were, what their appetite for buying, you know, something like this was. But um, so when you look at a particular road or a particular neighborhood in a town in your catchment area, do you know, is there a way to identify um, which addresses are very specifically served. You know, they maybe have Comcast, they maybe have uh, Consolidated. Uh, maybe you don't know who their provider is, but through whether it's Department of Public Service data or maybe work that you've done internally, do you know on this road, there are 10 unserved addresses um, or there are there is currently no opportunity for any of these addresses to um, receive service. We, we know that this road is unserved, that there are 10 houses on this road. And part of our business assumption is that we're going to get four of those houses right. if we run fiber up the road. So I'm just curious on how much intelligence um, you have as to, you know, how many of those homes are unserved and, you know, what that looks like, um, you know, going forward. The Department of Public Service does have a list that has identified the nearly 70,000 under and unserved addresses all over the state. And those are available to us to be part of our, uh, for our district to be part of our planning process. So to okay. that so you, extent, yes, we do. So you can see those specific addresses on that, on that yes. road. Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I don't see any other hands up, so I think we'll, um, oh, FX, did you want to chime in? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say that we do have uh, maps now that show uh, where the cable providers are, uh, where the fiber providers are. And uh, we also can put uh, points on the map for each of the E911 addresses and code them by the level of service that they have. So it's quite, it's relatively straightforward to visualize uh, broadly where there is the biggest need, uh, where there's the most competition uh, and 
you can also do uh, just mathematical tests of what your penetration rate in a particular town would need to be <clears throat> in order to uh, meet the formula that EC Fiber uses uh, when it's uh, making a determination about the viability of building out uh, in an area. And, uh, you know, so far it works uh, to plan on connecting all premises everywhere, uh, even in <clears throat> some very rural areas. Uh, we're going to be finishing 22 of our original 23 towns uh, this year. And uh, I won't say that every single road is being covered, but the roads that are excluded essentially go up into the hills and there are uh, only uh, some seasonal camps. Uh, I don't believe that we're leaving out uh, any permanent uh, residences. So. Great, thank you for that. Oh. Um, Anne, did you wanna follow up? Yeah, I just want to um, back to Mark. Uh, Mark's question about surveys. I had kind of forgotten we did this, but at the beginning of our process, the the original grant to do a feasibility study and a business plan from the Department of Public Service went to Wyndham Regional Commission. And at the beginning of that process, way back in February, um, part of that process in developing our feasibility study was an extensive survey of all of the communities in our area. So yes, we did do it. We just did it a long time ago and my adulpated aging brain forgot. <laughs> February was about 18 years ago. Yes, it point, was. So. And it was before the, uh, the pandemic because we all met in a room and planned it out. <laughs> exactly. Great, well, thank you, Ann. Um, let's turn to Christine now. Christine, uh, welcome uh, back. You, uh, I was recalling this morning, had provided testimony to our hearing, uh, to our committee, um, about a year or so ago, uh, in some sense, wearing your, your former hat as a, um, an electric utility executive and um, you know, kind of the, the uh, connection between our electric utility world and um, our, kind of our burgeoning uh, broadband world, if you will. But um, now uh, you're wearing a new hat, you're working with NEK uh, broadband. Um, so welcome, look, look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, and I'm excited to be here and working on this uh, very important issue. Uh, of course, I mean, it was an important campaign issue. I, you know, I, I stand by the, my premise that if Vermont wants to grow its economy, everybody needs to be connected by fiber in the long term, and I'll get to, get to that rationale in a moment. But the, um, you know, for the record, I'm Christine Hulquist. I began working on rural broadband issues in 2003 when the Vermont Electric Cooperative Board of Directors asked me what do we need to do to get every, every one of our members connected? Um, and of course, that's been a 17 year uh, passion and problem. Uh, so, but I will say there's, you know, there are 40 electric cooperatives nationwide serving rural areas with even significant less densities in Vermont that have been successful with this. And there's a lot of data available, um, which I'm very familiar with because I was on the, uh, I was spent 10 years on the, the advisory committee to the NRECA for these issues. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to kind of put my boots where my mouth is. You know, many politicians talk about things, but hope, hope we're, we're going to get this done. But uh, NEK Broadband, you know, we're, we're like the rest of the, uh, the, the um, CUDs, you know, we're, we're a relatively new organization, uh, probably a little newer than some others. Uh, but you know, I'm quite impressed. I was very impressed the work that this all volunteer group has done on their own. And I'm actually their first contracted employee. Um, so we're, you know, we serve right now, we serve 31 towns in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, and we're, you know, we're, we're looking at immediate solutions. We're going to partner with those uh, incumbent providers to try, by, to try to provide as much wireless as possible. Uh, what we want to, our ultimate goal is to get everybody connected in fiber. But of course, as the COVID crisis has taught us, we have an immediate problem and we have to be careful in terms of uh, paying attention to our business case because every time we you know, connect a, a wireless customer to an existing provider, 
it diminishes the quality of our business case, which is the real problem that we're with telecommunications in general in this country. You know, it, it, back in 1935, uh, when FDR, uh, our, actually it was our George Aiken from Vermont who brought this issue to uh, the federal government. And actually the first electric pole in the United States was set up in Eden Mills, Vermont. Um, it, because th at that time, it, it was very aware that 56% of America's landmass would probably not get electricity based on the, uh, the model that we're using in telecommunications. Uh, because what happens is, and this is what we're experiencing today, as you take those higher density areas away and give those to the incumbent providers, the business case becomes increasingly more difficult to serve those last areas. In the NEK, we have some of the most economically challenged uh, pe pe uh, residents in the state, and we have some of the least density in the state. So for us, it's a very, very difficult issue that we're dealing with. And I wanna talk about why you hear, uh, why you hear the CUDs talking about fiber, why fiber is so important, because as I get back into this, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, people saying, well, why do we need fiber if we've got Starlink and we've got, you know, uh, LTE coming? Well, let me just give you a, an example. A typical, a typical LTE or uh, this is an LTE tower I'm talking about, not 5G. I doubt a little later I'll explain why 5G is, won't really be practical for Vermont at all. But a typical LTE tower can transmit 1.4 gigabits per second. That's 1400 megabits per second. That's gotta be shared with everybody on that tower. So I'm gonna use uh, 4K HD video as an example. When you go to Netflix today and you go to rent a new video, it's probably gonna be 4K, 4K HD. 4K HD uh, is 25 megabits per second to run it. And I've got all this in the presentation for you to follow through later. But so that means one tower can have 56 users running those 4K HD videos. Let, let me tell you, a, a one strand of fiber can handle more than 100 terabytes per second. A terabyte is a thousand gigabytes or a million megabytes. So when I talk about 100 terabytes, this is a that, that'll give you 4 million users. That's one strand of fiber less, you know, about the size of a human hair that's hanging on our poles. For example, VEC, we've got uh, several hundred miles of fiber and it's 144 strands. But just one of those strands will handle 40 million users, 4 million, I'm sorry, 4 million users. 4 million users versus 56 users on a wireless tower. So that's really gives you the dramatic example of the difference between uh, between um, the wireless and, and uh, fiber. Now, now when we talk, many people talk about um, the the uh, the uh, amazing ability of five G to provide a lot of data. And I want to show you a picture here when I talk about this. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, I guess I can't share my screen. It says host, host participant disabled host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Well, anyway, it's in your presentation. I, I think you're a co-host, Christine, if you've got something you want to pull up. I, I thought, Danielle, could you check that? Uh, yes, uh, Christine is a co-host. Yeah, I think it might be an idiosyncrasy of my, of my I, I run, I run like in any, I run Linux, so Linux is probably not letting me do that. But, I, but it's, in okay. your, it's in your packet or it's yep. in the presentation. So if we look at, if we look at, uh, existing LTE towers, if what happens with 5G is 5G gives you a lot more data, but it can't penetrate obstacles like trees and hills. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, uh, it has one one hundredth the ability to penetrate those obstacles that um, LTE has. And the distance, you know, goes from 20 miles down to a third of a mile. And that third of a mile is a, you know, it assumes a straight shot. So, you know, you look at LTE, it, it's gonna take, you know, 100, 100 times more towers. And of course we have, we can't even make the business case for enough towers to cover Vermont already with the LTE. So just wanna make it clear that the challenge of wireless is, is significant. Um, oh, there we go, nice. 
that, yeah, there's the graphic that shows you the difficulty of, of um, 5G versus LTE. And what happens, so the reason that happens is you go, to get more bandwidth using wireless, you have to go up in frequency. As you go up in frequency, you get less ability to penetrate, which means you get need more transmitters and towers. So these graphics really dramatically show that, that physical difference. So now let's talk about Starlink. I've heard a number of people talk about Starlink. Starlink is the SpaceX program that's going to put these satellites up in low Earth orbit. Um, so one Starlink satellite can provide 20 gigabits per second. So each one of those satellites costs a million dollars. One strand of fiber is equal to 5,000 satellites, assuming they were dedicated to your territory, right? Assuming they were dedicated to one. 5,000 satellites at a million dollars each is $5 billion. Now, if you, if you take into the consideration that we're all hanging 144 strands, we got the capacity of 720,000 satellites dedicated to our area. So, you know, our state, if we populate the entire state, it's going to be less than one one thousandth of the cost of satellites. So ultimately, that is why that's I'm explaining the physics of why we believe you've got to get the fiber to every home. Now, we know we're not going to get there right away. So which is why we have to work, which is why any K broadband is going to partner with existing providers, and it is going to degrade our case over time. But one of the things we want to do also is build up our asset base as much as possible. So, you know, I've already started discussions with partners to talk about, hey, you know, if we provide you the assets for your tower, will you set up a tower in an area that doesn't quite meet the business case? The nice thing is once we service that area with fiber, we can actually move those wireless assets somewhere else to serve even less penetrated areas. So the wire, building the wireless strategy and moving forward um, is a, it, it's not like a sunken investment. We can continue to move those assets around. Um, so it, it is a good strategy and, and um, you know, and I, and that, and I think that's, uh, that's been addressed in the uh, telecommunications plan as well as all the discussions that have with you. One of the things we, we need to do, we're going to look to, and this really gets to what legislation do we need? We're going to be looking for legislation to support us to do, to do what are called um, indefeasible right of use, IRUs, for existing state fiber networks and utility fiber networks. Um, the, the IRUs are a way that we can count the, the fiber as an asset. So for example, where are the utilities in the state of run 144 fibers? We might look for an IRU for 12, you know, one tube of those fibers. And then we can count that asset on our books. And it's important for the CUDs to build up their assets because that's how we can leverage funding. And I will tell you, you know, that I've, I've worked nationally with CoBank and Cooperative Finance Corporation, two cooperative banks that have been funding build outs at municipals and um, cooperatives throughout the country. And they're loaning money at two and a half percent right now. So, you know, it's a good time to be building capital. So the immediate problem we have, which is really why we need the help. Uh, and, and by the way, you know, we are also going to be doing some, uh, we plan on construction in the next two years. So we will, you know, we'll want to access VITA funds as well. Uh, but again, it's important that we by hook or by crook can figure out how, how to build this asset base, which is why I believe it is important for the state to provide their existing assets to the CUDs. And speaking of the CUDs in terms of, um, of strengthening the CUDs, I, I think the CUD is a, is a, was a marvelous idea in how to accomplish what we're trying to do. For, and I can't think of a better idea. At this point, I would ask the legislature to do everything you can to strengthen those CUDs. We're all kind of new, and, um, and we may not have the expertise at this point, but I think you should demand us to provide those answers. You put us in place, just like anything else, now hold us accountable for getting Vermont to where it needs to be. This is our job. Now, what it means by our job, of course, holding us accountable is I also would like all of state, and we, you know, we would like all of state grants to be funded through the CUDs. In other words, 
uh, we'll we'll work with the partners, the incumbent uh, providers, but at the same time, you know, we we talk when Ann Menwaring talks about the competitiveness issue, we should operate under open meeting law, and we should provide all this. But the protect we should provide all this information publicly. Um, however, we also if we control the purse springs, now, now you and everyone else can look into our tent and see what we're doing. And that becomes a requirement for our partners as well. If you're gonna work with us, you gotta understand it's, you know, it's, it's, the information's gonna be public. I got news for you. Vermont's not a gold mine. These incumbent providers are not, making, not gonna make a killing in Vermont. You know, I had conversations with Consolidated uh, three years ago they said, look, we're not going to build fiber in Vermont because we're going to spend our money in North Carolina and these other states where there's have the densities make greater sense. So I do believe that we can operate under public meeting law as long as we have the advantage of controlling this, the, purse, the purse strings. Um, so and I, now that gets to the next issue, which gets to the mapping database and the polls and assets. A number of utilities, and I'm in conversation with them, so I don't necessarily want to talk about it publicly what those conversations are, are right now, but a number of those utilities are already doing, have already mapped their assets. And I'll always say, I will say publicly, I know 60% of Vermont Electric Co-op co polls have been asked, they, oh, first of all, 100% of their polls have been done uh, in, in the GPS system because I started that personally in the year 2000. But, but the, the old data is not good enough. But the new data, 60% of their poll data is sub-meter accuracy and had, there's pictures for every poll. But the problem is right now, the, you, I'll speak, now I'll move up to in general because I don't want to just uh, you know, take shots at my old employer. But that, those, that some of those utilities want to sell that data. They don't want to make it public and make it available. Well, I would argue that Look, our ratepayers paid for this. We need to. We should. We should demand a public database of all the existing assets and all the existing information, so that first of all, we're not double spending where we no, don't need to, and secondly, that poll, poll data that poll database needs to be updated in real time as changes occur, and they are updated in real time, at least in the utility I used to work for, because that's why we set up the whole system. So, you know, I, I think it's very important that we demand that the utilities keep that public. And, and can we make the telecom providers keep, make it public? Probably not because of FCC, you know, the, we just don't have the federal, federal uh, jurisdiction to do so. But that said, the telecom data isn't that accurate already because the telecom haven't gone out and GPS their system. Uh, they just aren't making those kind of investments. The utilities have and are. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a, a, ma a major issue we need help on as well. Um, and I would also tell you that, you know, we, with, I, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the emergency broadband action plan, there's a statement in there that, the, that fiber should be prevented at, provided at a dollar per strand mile. If we provided, fiber at a dollar per strand mile, we could populate, you know, that makes all the business models work. Now, what you're going to hear is today, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to cross subsidize telecommunications, but the reality is I'll tell you what my, my CEO used, my CFO used to tell me, Christine, you give me 2% load growth. We don't have to go in for a rate increase. So, so I'm going to make a similar argument to the tax increment financing district. You know, today, as, uh, and let me also add, uh, electric low growth, good electric low growth is directly correlated to economic activity. The economic activity goes up, the load goes up. Economic activity goes down, the load goes down. And, you know, so I wanna, I'm not talking about efficiency programs and all that, that's all bad low growth. I'm talking about good low growth. So I would argue that making investments now helps the electric utilities in the long term because ultimately that investment, although they may be, there may be some level of cross subsidization today, that'll pay for itself by the long-term low growth that results from the growth in economic activity in Vermont. 
you know, we changed that curve. And of course now, you know, Vermont, you know, when, you, when you talk to real estate agents in Vermont today, what they'll tell you is, yeah, we got a lot of people want to buy homes in Vermont, but the first question they ask is, am I, can I get connected? So that, so that's essentially my presentation and, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Christine. That was great. I, I have to tell you that um, I, I was kind of chuckling to myself. I, uh, our, th our three guests were um, witnesses in the Senate Finance Committee earlier this week. And um, gosh, I think you testified for a couple of hours. And I set my YouTube setting on double time so I could listen to it twice as quickly. Um, Christine, you have a lot, you, you can, you compact a lot that you say in a short amount of time. And I had to slow it down. I think to 1.25 when you were speaking so I can keep up, but <laughs> that, that, that's, that was great information. Um, Mark, I see your hand up and then Mike, go, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Christine, a question. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more when you, what you talk, what you're talking about when you talking, controlling the purse strings? Well, today, of course, when the state issues telecommunication grants, it opens them up to all of the incumbent providers. I would suggest that you require the CUDs to do those RFPs. And, and any money that gets directed to, uh, to an area, uh, any state grant money, go to the CUDs. So we can, we can uh, determine our long-term business case. Now, what, what I'm saying to you is, of course, we're going to partner with existing providers uh, because that is right now the goal is to get as many Vermonters connected as possible. It's really a hierarchy of goals. First goal, get as many Vermonters connected as possible. Then secondary, we have to get to the long term uh, fiber to every premise, which will will never happen with the incumbent providers because we just don't have the business case. The numbers that I run show that once you get below 12 customers per mile, you can't serve them with the existing models. You've got to use your higher densities, your 20 customers per mile to fund the lower densities. Um, typically, the, uh, the incumbent carriers do their cutoff somewhere around 20. But we have areas in, you know, up in Canaan that are four customers per mile. So, so ultimately, that's why I would argue you'll never see fiber get to those most rural parts of Vermont unless we strengthen the CUDs. Did I answer that question for you? Yes, thanks, Christine, yep. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, uh, thanks, Christine. Uh, that was a lot of good information you gave us. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one being, do you have an estimate of the total cost it would take to uh, meet the coverage you'd like to, to meet in Northeast Kingdom? I don't have a total cost at, at this point, but in, in the um, Emergency Broadband Action Plan, they identified a figure, which is about what I've assumed for the state all along, which is somewhere, probably somewhere around 350 to 400 million. So you could take, you know, the, the, uh, the surface area of the Northeast Kingdom and compared to the rest of the state and probably figure that, I think we're about 20% of the state. So I'm guessing about 70 to $80 million. So Ballpark about seventy million. Yeah, but understand, we you, we could get three, uh, we could get two thirds of that funded through low and through you know CoBank and CFC. You put a good business plan together, you'll get uh, two thirds of it funded through long term financing. And I believe this is very appropriate for long term financing because what happens is you're building an infrastructure that's going to last thirty to forty years. It's not necessary to have everybody pay for that up front. By, by taking a long-term loan, you're actually spreading that cost amongst all the future users as well. So in terms of time frame, how, how long would it take you to get to everybody? Well, I would say if we, you know, if cash was not the, I mean, that when I say cash is not the issue, I mean, we, we do this with responsible spending, but doing it, I would say we could get to everybody in five years. And probably 90%, 90, 85%, three years or something like that. But it's always the last that becomes the most difficult. Okay, so when you were when you were runner for governor, you were talking about, um, I guess, 
utilizing um, the, the, the infrastructure of the electric utilities, and I'm assuming the fiber lines that they use um, for connectivity. And I'm wondering, is that, are you figuring that at all? Or are you talking about running uh, separate fiber? I think I, so my assumption is, and this is again, we talk about future legislation. The way, the, the way to drive this is to get the, electri uh, the electric utilities to hang the fiber. And we are, because that is, the, that is the least expensive way to do it. Um, it's, it. And again, I go back to that argument of it's to serve the public good. And if you look at the charter of regulated utilities, that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, so the other thing I just want to want to verify that I understood what you said in your last part of your um, statement that load growth due to the greater appeal as a result of having fiber connectivity would result in more electric demand, which would benefit the utilities. So. Yes, I go back to that. Uh, what, yeah, to explain that, basically utility has a, a fixed asset base and that has to get paid for whether you have, you know, a, a million customers or a hundred thousand customers, you have a hundred thousand, it's cost them 10 times as much for the asset base, right? So, so the point is, if you grow, if you grow your customer base, you, you, you will increase, that's good load. And oh, by the way, if we grow our customer base and we're seeing that this is why you saw the outages in California. When, if you read about those, uh, those rolling outages that just happened in California, it was because people were working at home. So, so ultimately, people working at home, is, it increases electric load. But from an environmental standpoint, it's better because people are driving. You know, I think well, if there's anything I learned from this COVID crisis is, holy cow, did I waste a lot of time driving my life and, and yes. <laughs> You know, I would drive, you know, six and to think that people, I was getting paid for this. You know, I would drive six hours round trip for a three hour meeting at Velco in Rutland. You know, how crazy is that? <laughs> and so. Right. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, that's all the questions I have at this point. Thanks. Uh, Scott, did you have a question? Yes. Thank you. Hello, Christine. Um, just w wondering uh, uh, about more detail around getting the electric utilities to string the fiber. One of the things that I remember you talking about a couple of years ago was using the electric space. And we've heard a lot of pros and cons about that. Could, could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, the, so, you know, I, VEC and, and I were personally partners on the, the, the Northlink project years ago. And I look at that project and we, you know, our goal for that project was to get as much straight through fiber as possible to our substations. We weren't thinking about getting fiber to every home and business. So, you know, I kind of kicked myself in the butt for not having that foresight back then. But at the same time, so if I did to do that over again, here's what we would do. You would have the utilities string what's called all dielectric self-supporting fiber in the electric space. All dielectric self-supporting fiber is fiber that has no metal in it and it's very light. Um, then you would put uh, fiber access points, you know, every five poles or so. That would allow local fiber loops for the telecom workers to use um, and, and extend that to the last homes. You know, I throw out five poles, it could be 10, could be 20, but every X number of poles, you do a fiber drop. It's going to change in, in, based then, on area, area density. And then so, the, uh, Telecom workers work from telecom. there on the lower part of the pole. Yeah. So what you've heard people say, because you know, it's it, 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 you really have to explain this to folks. Say, well, if you put it in the fiber space, we can't access it. Of course, you, you can't. Then you need the electric utility workers to do that. And actually, that may not be a bad thing either, because ultimately, you know, that the, they're they're out serving that same set of infrastructure. But you know, to address those concerns, you know, and still have be able to have. Um, the telecom workers, you, know, you could you could do with fiber access points. Okay, interesting. Thank uh, you, M Mike. Did you have a follow up? Yeah, just a follow up question. When we we're talking about um, the utilities and hanging fiber, uh, were you talking about 
contracting with the utilities to hang the fiber as opposed to paying another entity to do it? Oh, I'm saying the utilities should do it. Yeah, sure. Utilities, yeah. think about it. They already they already got the everything in place to hit every every home in the state. You know, no right. sense making redundancy there. So it wouldn't be a cost to the race to the ratepayers of the utility. Uh, it would uh, the cost will still be borne by the CUDs. Uh, no, I'm arguing that it yes, it should be a cost to the ratepayers. I go back to that's that's why I'm trying to change this thinking from say separation of telecommunications and electric, because the two are codependent on each other. Not only not only will it create load growth, which will benefit the utilities in the long term, benefit all of us through low, through lower rates, but I would uh, now let's talk about climate change. You know, we are not going to solve climate change until we get connectivity and device. And I'll use, I'll, I'll tell you why. First, let's start with the fact that 80% of our energy use in the United States today comes from fossil fuels. So in order to solve climate change, we got to move our entire system over to electricity. Now you move the entire system over to electricity, you're trying to uh, fuel that system with sun and wind you know, and, and, and maybe whatever you can get from ocean and other areas, you, you got an intermittency problem. I'm going to use an example for you just to really put, put this out as a stark example. You know, Tesla has these tractor trailer rigs. They're, they have a 500 kilowatt battery plant. That's, that's half a megawatt, 500 kilowatt. They're going to want to charge it in 10 minutes. So 10 minutes means that 500 kilowatt power plant is going to draw three megawatts off the power line. Well, the average feeder in the United States is only three megawatts. So, so you know, essentially you collapse the line for that one truck. So you gotta have the system set up where you've got end communication with all the devices so that you don't crash the electric system. <laughs> so, you know, it, this, you know, you look at the long-term vision of, of, of solving climate change and our telecommunication goals, there are, intrinsically entwined. Okay, so um, so would the CUDs contribute at all to hanging the fiber? I, well, I don't, uh, you know, I guess we could. It just, it just depends what, the, what our goals are. I mean, if I, the money's got to come from somewhere, right? Yep. And I'd rather not see it come from the taxpayers. So that gets to the jo job that you're doing. You know, although I want to, you know, I had a desire to do the job you're doing. I also have a lot of empathy for what you're doing because right now, and it's a lot worse than when I ran two years ago, you know, you're making decisions between health and long-term telecommunication investments. You know, I'd rather see those telecommunication investments coming from a different source than, than the taxpayer pockets. Okay, thanks. Uh, Seth Chase, go ahead, Seth. All right. Um... Thank you. I think I heard, uh, first, I totally agree. Utilities are utilities and should work together. That, yes. Um, I think I heard a statement about fiber splices, and then I thought I understood what you were saying, and then you said something. That, so I wanted to ask a clarification. Um, when you're talking about every couple of poles, are you talking about a splice in the fiber, a loop in the fiber, or a drop? Let, I'm talking about a drop. Out, a drop. out of the electrical space. Yep. and creates a junction point that can be easily accessed, right? That's, that's correct. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you, Christine. Um, and we'll, we'll come back uh, after FX's testimony and questions and um, have more of a group discussion. Um, FX, it looks like you're sitting right outside Queechy Fells Barn there off the ninth green on the Highland course. Um, so. You got it, Tim. I, yeah, I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Uh, virtually, virtually. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us. And um, I, my understanding is that you have the capability of pulling a presentation up if you want to do that. Yes, I will do that. But first, uh, I want to just say for the record, uh, my name is FX Flynn. The initials are for uh, Francis Xavier. Uh, <clears throat> I am the chair of the EC Fiber Governing Board. I assume that role in May. Uh, after the legendary uh, Irv Tomei <clears throat> decided to step down. And uh, he has agreed to uh, continue uh, 
uh, on our executive committee and serves as our government relations officer. Uh, and uh, I have to say that I'm standing on the shoulder of a uh, giant doing what I'm doing. Um, in terms of uh, EC Fiber uh, and the work that this committee uh, did uh, back in May and June, uh, I want to report that we were the beneficiaries of a million dollar, uh, a combined million dollar uh, pair of grants uh, that uh, we have put to use doing underground work uh, to provide service to uh, mobile homes throughout our district in areas where we are already uh, uh, in place and uh, ready to go. Uh, as I speak, uh, the uh, third of 13 uh, trailer parks in our district uh, is having a conduit installed to serve every single uh, uh, location uh, in the park. Uh, and we're gonna get that all done uh, probably by Thanksgiving. And uh, for each of those locations, uh, we'll have the fiber line, we'll have the uh, equipment necessary to uh, make the connection to the home. And at that point, the only barrier uh, would be the ability of the household to uh, pay the monthly costs. And uh, we've got uh, hopes that we're gonna be able to put together uh, a, uh, uh, between the connect between the uh, emergency um, lifeline broadband program uh, and uh, some private funding that uh, we're hoping to get put together over the course of the next uh, month or so, uh, that we'll be able to do some uh, subsidiza subsidization for uh, families that are in uh, economic distress in our district. And uh, none of this would be possible uh, without this kind of once in a lifetime opportunity to uh, spend these uh, CARES dollars uh, on this. So I, I really thank the, this committee for, uh, for its work in saying yes to that idea back in June. Um, I'll also say that uh, uh, we are lined up for the second round of uh, connectivity initiatives, uh, which if we get, uh, should help us uh, get even more crews out there and help us with our goal of completing the build out in 22 of our original 23 towns. The one town that won't be completely built out is my town, Hartford. I've been on the EC Fiber Board since 2012. Uh, and uh, the priority for EC Fiber has been to build out in unserved areas. Uh, Hartford has uh, Comcast for much of the area, uh, not up in our northwest uh, quadrant uh, uh, with uh, Sharon and Norwich, uh, west the West Hartford uh, area. So we are going to be building that uh, this year. In fact, I think crews are out in that area uh, as I speak. Um, so that's exciting. Now we've also added eight new towns in, this year in uh, May and July. And uh, they are mostly up to our north, uh, Newberry, Bradford, the Fairleys, uh, Corinth. And then uh, we've also added Windsor uh, to our south, which although it's mostly VTEL uh, to the west of I-91, uh, it's nothing. And so we're gonna be building in from uh, West Windsor where we already have um, service in place. So there's, there's quite a lot going on. Um, uh, before I put anything else up, I also wanted to just uh, say about uh, VCUDA, uh, a wonderful acronym that uh, Jeremy Hansen of CV Fiber came up with. Um, the, uh, we have established uh, the weekly meeting, which you've heard about. Uh, we also have a shared Google Drive where we are able to share documents. Uh, and in particular, uh, we've been trying to post uh, examples of the way EC Fiber has been doing things. And CV Fiber is also fairly well along. They've been posting things. And as each new CUD uh, uh, takes a step, 
uh, it's been adding to that bank. So that is actively happening. I want to say that uh, uh, we recognize that need and we're and we're trying to meet it. Uh, we also have a shared uh, group email, which allows us to uh, rapidly disseminate and share information among the CUDs. So, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, work to do to build up our organizational bones, but um, uh, in this uh, all hands on deck period, uh, we're at least that far along. So, uh, I wanted to um, begin uh, with a, just a brief overview of where I think uh, we're at uh, statewide in terms of solving the rural broadband crisis. And um, in 2019, the state put a stake in the ground and said that the state's strategy for doing this is EC fiber is the model. So we're going, we want to see more CUDs stood up. And I think it's important to point out that over the long haul, every single dollar that the CUDs need to get up and running, uh, it gets paid back by customer revenue. So uh, this talk about subsidizing the CUDs, this talk about needing to put more taxpayer dollars into the CUDs, uh, it, over the long haul, uh, no, customer revenue is going to pay for all that. The trick is until there's customer revenue, uh, uh, we need the dollars uh, from someplace else. Uh, so originally the idea was that we would leverage the VITA facilities and there we would provide small grants for the feasibility studies and so forth. But then of course the pandemic came. So the strategy is still good, but I, the tactics need to change. We need to mobilize money a lot faster. Uh, at this point in time, no CUDs have gotten to the point where they can apply for VITA. And of course, the uh, matching issue is a big deal. So the $2 million that was proposed uh, uh, solves a very important uh, problem. And uh, we, you know, we strongly support, uh, we strongly support the money for that, for that purpose. Um, of course, we also understand that the CARES funding uh, is restricted, but under uh, uh, speeding up deployment and being able to reach people uh, sooner rather than later, uh, there, is, uh, there is support for spending on uh, planning and, uh, and data collection. So how are we gonna win this war? So we have 70,000 addresses out of 308,000 in the state. 10% uh, of those are gonna be taking care of EC fiber. We've already taken care of a big chunk. That number would be closer to uh, 100,000 without what we've uh, already done. Uh, 39,000 of those addresses on 5,700 road miles are in towns that have actually joined uh, CUDs. Another 21,000 are in study areas. Uh, and so towns that, are, that would be candidates to uh, join the CUDs. Uh, so if seven CUDs build 350 miles a year for the next four years, that, that, that would be close to the 10,000 miles that we're talking about. And not every mile needs to be built, by the way, but so we'll just say that that would take care of it. Now, EC Fiber had trouble building 300 miles a year. It's, 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 it's a big challenge. So uh, doing this for all of the CUDs is a really big challenge. Uh, in many ways, this is a big uh, jobs program in Vermont uh, as well. If you can imagine all the work that would uh, need to be done. I also wanna point out that uh, EC Fiber, it took us three years to start building. And then it took us five years to access the municipal bond market. And now it's going to have taken us six years to complete our original 23 towns. So that all began in 2008 and should all would all be wrapping up in 2021. And so the new CUDs this year and next year, they have to make the progress that it took us eight years to make from 2008 to 2015. Uh, 
Now, I think this is doable, but I think that we all, I think that we need to be focused on this. And I just, I have a chart here with the numbers that you can look at later, but basically uh, by the end of 2021, if only EC Fiber is building, uh, we're gonna get it down to 63,000 addresses or 21% of the premises in the state. Uh, if only the member towns finish building out by 2024, we'll get that number down to just 8% of the state. And if the study towns are included, it'll be down to just 1% of the state. And that 1% are in uh, fringe areas around Chittenden County, like uh, in Bolton. And in the same way that EC Fiber serves some customers in Bridgewater, where VTEL uh, is, but uh, they don't come over the hill uh, on the border of Woodstock. Well, we're, we're filling in those roads. So I firmly believe that at the end of the day, that'll, uh, that, that will be taken care of. So, the, so the, the, the two million or the million and a half for the Vita matching, that's only a start. Um, uh, we build cost effectively at 30,000 a mile. And so uh, two million unlocking eight million in Vita loans if it's spent perfectly, that would do 333 miles or 6% of uh, what are in the new HUD towns. So bottom line, we need to get the CUDs to the municipal bond market quickly. Customer revenues are the key. They need to start building. And, uh, and so my message is that the legislature and the executive both need to find ways to say yes to the CUDs. Uh, and I, I do have a very, some very specific, a very specific proposal uh, that uh, I know the, uh, the committee has seen. Hang on a second here. Um, and uh, that involves the concept of doing uh, what I call a poll harvest and using the uh, CARES money. Uh, for that. Now, oh dear, apologies. Uh, the notion of the uh, of the poll harvest is that until we have poll data, uh, network design uh, cannot begin. Uh, and if you can't do design, then you have no way of estimating uh, what your, uh, what materials you might need. So you have no way of uh, pre-ordering things like the fiber optic cable. Uh, you have no way of really uh, determining uh, how you're going to marshal uh, all of the uh, labor and equipment necessary uh, to uh, to make the build, and if if we do not have this uh, information put together uh, this fall, then this winter there's not going to be any opportunity to uh, do the design work necessary to bring us to that place. Now. The existing poll data that's out there that we've seen just is not adequate to design fiber to the home networks. Uh, and uh, I, I firmly believe that with the right combination of resources and um, uh, funding opportunities, all of which can be paid back, that we can get a number of these new cuts up and running and building the 25% of their network that the state's goal of having this done by 2024 implies. Um, uh, I'm also assuming that we can get this money put to work by mid-September, which is a huge stretch, obviously. Uh, and we can talk about some of the mechanisms that might make that possible. Um, we can collect uh, this data uh, for the winter in about an eight week period. So by the, uh, by the end of, uh, well, the middle of November, uh, because 
uh, what we have in mind to do is a uh, this mobile collection effort uh, using a million dollar piece of equipment that will have to be rented. Uh, and but as temperatures fall below freezing, that technology uh, uh, does not work as well. So uh, when it comes down to the pole collection, if we don't do the harvest, uh, we're going to miss the next construction season. Uh, if it's incomplete, then some areas will have no chance and the pole harvest season ends in uh, mid-November. Now, I've, I've already mentioned that uh, we've, we've identified a way of doing this uh, with vendors who are very familiar with New England. Uh, a guy, one of the guys grew up in the Upper Valley, another guy in Maine, uh, and, uh, and they really understand uh, the challenges that we face here uh, in terms of getting the poll data. And so they've got this mobile process and they've got uh, highly trained guys who know how to go out in the field with sophisticated equipment and get a lot done quickly. But, but, and here's the big problem. Um, in order to justify marshalling all these resources, we're gonna have to give them at least 50,000 polls to collect mobily and at least 15,000 poles to collect manually. So it's this is not something that EC Fiber can do on its own because with our new towns, we, we, we only have about uh, 9,000 poles that we need collected. Um, I wanna emphasize that the risk to the state is essentially zero. As I've said before, all these costs that go into the CUDs, they, they can all be covered by revenue backed municipal bonds down the line. And so if there's, if, if, if sometime in the future, uh, there was a clawback of CARES funds for this process, the CUDs would be able to just roll it into uh, uh, the next municipal bond they went after. Um, I talk about how, how we would actually do it, but I think, uh, You've probably seen this, um, and uh, a lot of this is uh, is up in the air. But we have thought about how we might uh, move forward. Um, in terms of an example, uh, uh, here are six uh, of the CUDs participating, and we get to fifty-one thousand polls that we can collect manually. Uh, uh, using the mobile device and 30,000 that we would collect uh, manually. And that's that 1.6 million. Um, you know, EC Fiber has already been thinking in terms of spending uh, 250 to $300,000 on this effort. Uh, and we were already planning on uh, borrowing that. So uh, uh, Representative Briglin, I would say that 1.5 million that you're now targeting, you know, actually turns into one point seven or 1.8 million. Uh, so we could actually, you know, see through uh, something of this uh, magnitude. Um, so the ask is really that we, there's either an appropriation or a grant or a loan of up to $3 million to do this poll data collection. Uh, and uh, it would be great if we could come up with a way to do this and get this project rolling uh, uh, two weeks from now. Uh, now, you know, I'm thinking, I know the executive has the ability to uh, direct some emergency funding, perhaps if they agreed to do that and the legislature replenished the funding, uh, that might be one way of doing it. I think that uh, in order to uh, simplify and speed this up, uh, you know, direct grants to the CUDs uh, based on their identified uh, poll counts uh, that they would then run through EC Fiber is, is the most direct way to do it, as opposed to going through a lengthy uh, process where uh, it's a new program or it's um, stuck in under the resiliency program at DPS and then they have to go through a process of coming up with uh, RFPs and, and soliciting bids. And I mean, by the time that's all done, it's early November and, you know, forget it. Uh, we would just say at that point, 
uh, uh, we're not gonna do that uh, this year. So that's the challenge right now is that we've got a, it, you know, unfortunately we are in a, uh, a pull harvest crisis. So uh, uh, with that, um, I, would, I would just say that my vision uh, is that uh, we can get uh, these, uh, all the CUDs uh, up and running and they can be building and somewhere down the line, you're going to see a picture of Vermont looking something like this, where all towns are associated or affiliated with the CUD in, in some shape or form. Um, I'm informed that the uh, Middlebury-Dixon line between Addison and Rutland is a real thing. So maybe that big uh, yellow group on the uh, west side is actually two. Uh, but... Um, but over the long haul, uh, we can do it. And there was a question about what the cost would be. I've got that worked out at EC Fibers, uh, 30,000 a mile. I compared that to the emergency broadband action plan funding. Uh, and uh, there were some differences, but they're, they're all easy to account for. Um, and, uh, and I actually believe that, uh, you know, based on what we're looking at at EC Fiber, uh, we probably will have, uh, right now we've got $41 million in loans out. Uh, we'll probably have something like uh, 52 to 55 million by the time we finish building out the 30 towns. Uh, so uh, again, these are ballpark back of the napkin uh, numbers, but the, uh, the dimensions are, uh, I believe, accurate and suggestive. So uh, with that, I will be quiet. No, we're not going to let you be quiet, FX, because um, we've got a couple of questions in the queue. Um, I, I'm going to actually jump in first because I've got a, a general question, um, which you don't need to go into the weeds on, but it touches on Christine's testimony and Anne's testimony as well and also kind of the evolution of where EC Fiber is. Um, at a high level, what are the, I'm gonna say three or four, maybe it's five or six, um, kind of uh, mile markers on the road between um, setting up an, a CUD at, uh, at town meetings and lighting fiber and serving customers so that they get fast uh, internet service. We've talked about a few different ones today. You know, we talked about poll surveys, we've talked about financing questions, obviously there are project cost issues and, and um, but what are those, again, I don't know if it's three or four things or five or six things kind of in the business uh, progression that get you from formation to customer service? Right. Well, <clears throat> back in uh, 2007, when the discussions began in the EC Fiber uh, district area about uh, doing something like this, <clears throat> the concept was that the towns would join together uh, and would uh, jointly float uh, uh, a $40 million municipal bond and we would go out and we would build everything by 2011. And so in 08, uh, at town meeting, uh, we had uh, tw 23 or 24 towns uh, sign up. And uh, then we had the, uh, we had the uh, economic crisis and we had uh, the state law change that forbade towns from uh, using uh, property tax. Yeah, well, and I, I'm not so much interested in history. I'm interested in step one is formation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Step so, two is business so, plan. <laughs> step three is poll surveys. Step four well, is financing. Step five is put the shovel in the ground and the fiber on the pole. I, I, that's that's quite fair, Tim, and, and sorry I got uh, distracted. No, that's okay. I mean, question. it's 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 a long and tangled history that I'm familiar with. I I, I was driving I was driving to I'm the point to that on what you've learned, you know, in the we last had, decade. 
Yeah, we, we, you know, until we, until we realized that we had to find financing on our own, that was the big problem at first is where is the money going to come from? So we've taken care of that. We, we, we now know the answer for all the CUDs. It's going to come from the, it's going to come from municipal bond market revenue bonds. That's where it's going to come from. Yeah. And, and so how do we get the CUDs to the point where they can access that market? Well, it, it took EC fiber, uh, five years after we began building to get to that market. So how are you going to jumpstart that for the CUDs? That's a, that, that, that is a really big issue. And, and that's, that's what I'm kind of focused on uh, in terms of understanding those mile markers of, you know, kind of the tasks of a CUD to get from formation to uh, customer service, um, what those mile markers are and how you can and how we can help you um, compress what that timeline is to get from formation to customer service that much more quickly. Um, you know, whether well, you know business plan and, and we're, we're talking a little bit this morning about um, poll surveys and, um, you know, those types of things. But again, one of my goals is to help CUDs compress that time frame. So I'm going to follow up with, with my second question is, um, what is the... Um, I don't even know what the analogy is. What is the, <clears throat> I'll say exit velocity you have to reach in order to um, access the public markets for, um, for bonding? Uh, you can't, you know, a, C a CUD that's starting up right now probably is not gonna go, uh, go to the, go to the uh, municipal bond market. What's that hill you've gotta get over uh, in terms of, I don't know if it's number of customers, I don't know if it's revenue, I don't know if it's asset base that is going to allow you to issue a $10 million municipal bond? Well, uh, in our case, we needed to have uh, three years of uh, financials that demonstrated that we were a going concern. So that that is a huge barrier. And I think that uh, there's going to have to be some kind of, um, some kind of state backed guarantee or a different facility is going to have to be used uh, in the uh, interim years so that uh, when the CUDs have reached that point of maturity, they can turn around and they can refinance uh, all of those uh, loans uh, with the municipal bond money, much in the same way that EC Fiber uh, had about uh, $5 million in private placement promissory notes. And in its first trip to the municipal bond market, it borrowed 7 million and immediately used the bulk of that to uh, pay off those promissory notes. So I, I don't know if we can do it through Vita. I don't know if there are other, uh, you know, what the other mechanisms might be, uh, but, uh, you know, somehow or other, uh, tens of millions of dollars will need to be loaned to the CUDs over the course of the next two or three years to get them to the to get them to escape velocity, as you as you put it. Yep. Uh, and and I you know I hope that uh, you know this is being I'd like to think that this is being addressed and thought through uh, at you know at the state level. Because that that's really that's the reality of implementing our strategy is we're going to have to find a way to loan those monies. I, I, you, there's another possibility that the federal government passes an infrastructure bill that has you know significant amounts of money in it that can be made available. Uh, I Chase, yep. Representative yeah. Chase is you know <laughs> you know I get it, I, but you know there's hope. Hope springs yeah. eternal, right? Well, um, that, that was actually a very helpful answer just in terms of, uh, and, and, and I had heard that before I'd forgotten it, that um, an important uh, milestone in accessing the public markets is the three years of operating history. Um, you know, to the extent that is still the case today, um, that's, a, that's a pretty finite, um, pretty finite barrier. 
Um, I've got a couple of hands up in the queue, FX. Um, I'm going to go to Laura first and then Mike. Hi, FX. Thanks for being here this morning. Hey, can you, um, going back to your slides, uh, you know, when we're thinking about different types of dollars that can be used to fund different types of needs. Um, this poll harvesting, um, you know, that's $3 million is a lot of dollars. Um, I see that you've got that um, being utilized throughout the state. Um, and I, I see being utilized in, um, in some CUDs, which I would consider uh, more youthful, uh, some of the younger CUDs. Um, and so <clears throat> certain types of funds, uh, for instance, if there were CRF funds, um, you know, those have to be utilized by November, uh, December, right? So um, my question is, is all this work possible by uh, November, uh, early December? Um, and how do you know that? And um, I, I'll just stop there and let you answer. Okay, I wanna just roll back to um, a couple of uh, something here that, <clears throat> so there's, there's, a, there's this mobile data collection equipment. It's, it's similar to what uh, Google, Google used to drive around and get uh, the pictures of everything that's on the road and to map where the roads go and, and, and so forth. Uh, and it uses, uh, it uses LIDAR technology and, uh, and uh, expensive cameras and GPS units. And, uh, and as you drive down the road, it, it picks up on, uh, on the poles reads the information on the polls and uh, you're able to collect uh, information about the height of the polls, the attachments on the polls, uh, get images of the polls. Uh, however, because the equipment is so expensive, uh, it, it really only makes sense to mobilize it if you're going after a large number of polls. So that's the, that's the basic answer. And the, the, the balancing act, you know, in talking with the guys who, who can do this uh, is um, getting access to the equipment and being able to uh, rent it. And there's a window of opportunity uh, coming up uh, end of September, early October. Uh, and then uh, it would be, uh, uh, getting out there and driving enough miles to collect enough poles that they could be paid for that work on a on a per pole basis. Uh, I'm sorry, you Laura, you're muted. Did you want to follow up, Laura? Hope oh, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm looking for, you know, what is the capacity that could be done? by November, and if you could, um, you know, walk us through, um, walk us through uh, what would need to happen in order for this, whatever the number is that you think that can be done by November, if you could kind of walk us through the steps that will need to happen in order for that to take place. Okay, so let's say by, let's say by Monday, September 14th, uh, we know that, uh, that, that the money to pay for this poll data collection effort uh, is going to be available. Uh, so at that point, uh, we would uh, enter into an agreement uh, with the vendors who are gonna do this work and we would make a down payment of around 250, dollars $350,000, uh, something in that dimension. Uh, they would then uh, mobilize the manpower, uh, mobilize the equipment, uh, and begin planning uh, for uh, the, 
the roads that they would drive to collect the poles that needed to be collected. And um, then by the middle of November, they would have been done with that. Now their, their best guess at how many poles they could really get to with that kind of a time frame, starting in mid-September, it's about 120,000 poles. So um, uh, that's why on the on the ask uh, page, uh, I mentioned that uh, three million dollars would allow collection for of up to 142,000 of the 205,000 poles in CUD towns, uh, but it's really uh, unlikely that more than 120,000 would be collected uh, between now and the middle of December to qualify for using the CARES money. Okay, uh, so what I'm hearing is that um, there is not, we, we probably can't do the whole $3 million worth of project by November. Um, we could do um, a portion of that. Um, I have two other questions, Mr. Chair. One is, what is the effect of you, um, the CUDs, getting access to these dollars after September 14th? Is the effect just less work done, or is the effect um, a, a increased likelihood the work cannot be done? That's my first question. Okay, so uh, the f so the first answer is that less work will be done the later we get to go, but then at a certain point, no work will get done. What is so that point? Early, What's the point? Early October. How early? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I actually, uh, if you give me a moment, uh, I have okay. an email uh, that I might that be able be... to give you a more specific answer. That would be great. And uh, my second question is, um, how will this data be kept updated? Because theoretically, it will change even as we're moving through it. So will it be in some sort of a share, like will it be shared amongst the CUDs and the utilities and the department? Like how would this data be held in a way that um, maintained um, its usefulness for as long as possible? Right. Uh, so the, the technical fail dates uh, October 5th. Okay. All right. Um, and then, uh, and then two weeks later, uh, it would, it would just be completely impossible because of, uh, because of the weather. So it's, okay. it's a very tight time frame. Yep. Um, uh, sorry, Laura, the, uh, the, the second the question, question was, um, how will this data, oh, this full okay, harvest data be man? be maintained um, because it will change. And so who will have access to it and how it will be kept updated? Okay, I think the best thinking on this comes from uh, David Healy at, at CV Fiber. Uh, and uh, he has posted up uh, a model for collecting this data, uh, which in fact, the guys who would be doing it are, are using essentially the same, uh, the same uh, ArcGIS uh, uh, model for uh, populating uh, poll data information. And, and David's idea is that uh, this would be something that would become a state asset uh, at the DPS and that anybody making any uh, changes or modifications to any polls would have to uh, report that in uh, so that it would always be uh, kept uh, up to date. So in theory, that, so that's the answer in theory. In, in a, in, Practical and immediate terms, uh, the the poll data would be uh, would be delivered to each of the CUDs uh, for their uh, design and engineering teams 
to make use of and for the CUDs to make use of in terms of making uh, make ready applications. And I also wanna say one of the benefits of, uh, of the data collection being done is because it's real time going into the GIS, uh, it is relatively straightforward uh, for make ready applications to be automatically generated uh, as the collection is done. And that reduces okay. the amount of work the CUDs have to do on the make ready applications. So if we were to, um, you know, I, I, so I, I'm curious about um, whether or not you have, if the department, um, if the department's on board with that, have you had conversations with the department about that, keeping that, them keeping that data um, and or the utilities and or um, any other poll owners? No, we, we, okay. nobody's, nobody's advanced it further than, okay. than you know, here's a concept. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Okay. A um, couple of questions. Uh, so the pole harvest, you're looking at the pole harvest as a discrete task um, and eligible for the uh, CRF funds. Okay, and that would be whatever you're doing there, whatever that 15,000 plus 50,000, 65,000 polls, uh, that would be completed by the end of the year is your estimate. And maybe uh, Tim or somebody else on the committee could uh, correct me, but I thought that uh, CRF money would require having actual connections completed by the end of the year. There's definitely money that we've allocated under CRF that does not um, result in connections. Um, there's planning money that we've used. There's money that we've used to um, accelerate the CUD uh, stand-up process, if you will. Okay. All right. So um, given that, um, as far as the 15,000 manual uh, pool, pools that have to be uh, harvested, uh, do they have to walk or will they use uh, like ATVs or something like that? I mean, that, it's a lot of miles to walk <laughs> for five people. It's, 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 it's mostly walking. Uh, and uh, because we're talking about pole easements that mostly go through the woods. Uh, it, we're not really talking about the poles that are in the electric corridors where you might be able to uh, take an ATV and, uh, and use the mobile equipment. Okay, um, and what kind of, uh, poll, what does poll data consist of? What do you have to, I mean, I, location is one thing, I know that. Yeah, submeter accuracy on the location. Uh, uh, when you're designing the network, that's really critical. Uh, also, attachment heights uh, is, is very important in terms of uh, the make ready applications uh, and, uh, and then additional information about the poles uh, in terms of um, whether or not there are drops going to uh, premises nearby, uh, uh, what sort of other uh, equipment or underground connections are on the pole, all of that, the more of that that you have uh, the more you can uh, account for in the design process, which ultimately makes it less expensive when you're out in the field building. Mm -hmm. So can any of this um, data collection be done using drones? Using drones? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, I've seen, uh, I was reading about one vendor that uh, is using uh, drone technology out in the Midwest um, with, uh, with some success. Uh, and uh, I, I reached out uh, to them to uh, you know, get some additional information and unfortunately uh, uh, was not able to penetrate the bureaucracy uh, to get an answer. Hmm. Okay. Um... And I, I guess it doesn't count, the polls that you're talking about are not related to uh, polls that are in 
our traditional telecommunication company territories or are they? Uh, uh, they would be any any polls uh, any polls. Uh, the uh, I think the only polls that would be excluded would be uh, transmission tower polls, like the one that uh, runs in our town from the Wilder Dam to the Taftsville Dam. Okay, so uh, I'm wondering about companies like Whitesville, Champlain Valley Telecom, who who are uh, actually uh, laying fiber. Uh, in their own territories, and would you not be counting those? Oh no, no, no. We no, we wouldn't be going after. Uh, we wouldn't be going after polls like that. So uh, we actually have a spreadsheet, town by town, cud by cud, uh, with the estimated number of mobile polls, estimated number of manual polls, and uh, we've been uh, having. The CUDs go in and and check off uh, which towns they would want to be sure were collected so that they could uh, start designing this winter and hopefully be building next summer. And so uh, I'm I'm waiting for all of that to be done. I believe that there are at least fifty thousand polls under you know any scenario, but now that. Uh, now that this idea is getting uh, significant traction uh, in the legislature and executive, uh, uh, we're going to have that task completed next week and have and have a really solid number for what we're going after. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you. Uh, I have to say, I bet the people out there in YouTube land find it a little amazing that we don't know where our polls are. Um, we don't have that data already, but. Um, Apparently, evidently, you've been you've you you sort of have been in touch with a contractor who can who can do this, this this uh, harvesting this poll data, um, and in effect, we have them queued up. This is this is uh, because you know getting a contractor to do anything in two weeks is, is impossible unless they have had it on their radar already for two months, uh, at least. Um, so uh, I, I find that that's really interesting. Um, I'm wondering whether, and you mentioned one idea about shaking loose the money to do this, uh, since the legislature is not likely to be able to act, you know, in, in a matter of a week. Um, one strategy for getting money to do this is, is to have the administration front the money, basically, uh, on their authority, and, uh, and then the legislature authorizes it um, as quickly as possible, possible after that. Um, I guess I'm wondering whether you've been in conversations with uh, the administration and have reason to believe that they would be willing to do such a thing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Irv has been uh, working that particular uh, thread for me uh, and uh, I don't have anything to report right now. Oh, well, I'm okay. waiting to hear, I'm waiting to hear from him. So we don't know is, is the... We, we, we don't know, but... Uh, I would encourage all of you to use your good offices to uh, to say, hey, this is a great idea. Let's do it. Uh, so, uh, right when we get down here. I, I also want to uh, say that oh, the guys who are going to do this work, uh, uh, you know, this would re represent a significant opportunity cost to them because they have other clients that they would have to uh, uh, put off right. uh, for a period of time. And that might result in them losing uh, those clients. And so that's another reason why it's not, uh, you know, in fairness, the mobile equipment is an important part of it and a big cost, but it's also true that these guys have clients and they're working and, uh, and, and so to be motivated to do this, you know, on top of the fact that they are, uh, that they're sort of local and they get it and they really want to help make this happen. Um, uh, we've also got to make it worth their, worth their while and getting that poll count up is a big part of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have a million dollar piece of equipment, you want to keep it working. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, two things uh, for the stuff going through the woods. I know for pulling lines, sometimes we use horses for the, the rest of the committee. Um, so I'm not sure if they'd be doing that for this, but uh, it doesn't always have to be walking. 
Um, but uh, FX, I was wondering, you mentioned Google and using similar equipment. I was wondering how much of this data already exists within Google and if it might be more economical to capture it from them. Yeah, they're not, yeah, they're not focusing on the polls. They're, they're taking pictures as they go down the block and identifying uh, points for navigation. Right. Uh, they're, not, they're not looking to collect the kind of um, data assets that, that we would need. I, I got to say that we, we ran into some issues with uh, our design because the poll data that uh, we collected, uh, you know, really wasn't uh, as good as it could have been. So we, we've learned a, a painful lesson about, uh, about the need for really good poll data. I'm sorry. It, well, I, I was just going to use your, your background as an example. There's a poll in the background. Um, and with the next photo from down the street, you could triangulate. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And me, that I, I don't know if that's more or less uh, expensive, but the, the resolution on those photos is usually good enough to capture the individual poll, um, the, like the tags and stuff. Um, and the tags of each photo, the metadata, um, I mean, just throwing out ideas there. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's been looked into. Uh, not I think if that were, I think if that were, yeah, I think if that were doable, these guys would be saying we could, you know, we could do this because they're they're so data intensive and the and the processing they do to pull this out. If it was already there, you know, it'd be a lot cheaper to just take that and just scrape that data and then and then do that work. So, uh, yeah, okay. I I don't think the feasibility is there to use what what's on the Google Maps. Unfortunately, appreciate it. Um, FX, I don't see any other hands up, I, and we've got about uh, five seven minutes left in our hearing time today. Um, I, you know, before um, I ask if there's any other questions for our witnesses, I also just wanted to go back to Christine and to Anne to see if you had, you know, any any uh, um, you know thoughts that came to mind or things that you hadn't mentioned earlier in your testimony. As um, you know, you've heard additional questions and um, additional um, thoughts from other witnesses today. I didn't want to let the hearing close without um, giving either or both of you uh, another word. So um, I don't know if there's any other thoughts you wanted to share based on what you've heard today. Yeah, I'll just do a little backing up with what FX was saying about poll collection data. You know, one of the problems we have, um, and I, you know, again, we, we, asked, we started GPSing our system back in 2000 and eliminated paper maps and paper maps put laptops on the trucks. But the thing we experienced about triangulation is when we triangulated our maps, we found sometimes they'd be a half mile off. So, so triangulating uh, uh, doesn't necessarily get you the accuracy you're looking for. What, I mean, the reality is sub-meter accuracy could work, but we're really, with the, the better the accuracy, the more the less pre-engineering we have to do. Pre, you know, poll collection is cheaper than engineering. So getting the right data, I suspect, you know, getting the, getting the right data is important. Um, I suspect that some of the utilities today who have collected the data in the past five or six years have it at the level we're looking for. But you know, can't stress enough how important having this database is and having it maintained. And really the only way we're gonna get it maintained is if properly is if the utilities work with the telecom providers, we all work together. If we have two separate databases, you'll never get it uh, fully updated. Both, they'll, both will be off. Um, Anne, did you have anything? Again, I didn't want to let the time go by without you having a chance to chime in again. Um, thanks very much, uh, uh, Tim. Uh, I, I just want to emphasize uh, the fact that we've talked a lot about the financing and the money that is needed to carry off this in the time frames that uh, are talked about, and uh, and and really encourage you folks at the state level to um, focus on the need to give the CUDs as much power as we will need 
to acquire our financing, whether it's directly or indirectly, or whether we can uh, use uh, one pot of money to um, morph into more money, or to uh, adjust regulations that favor us so that we, have, uh, we can compete in the competitive structure that we are in. Um, a lot of people don't think that way. Um, if you've never had it run a business, then how to operate inside a competitive marketplace, subject to the tyranny of the profit and loss statement, um, it's, it's much more difficult to understand how important that is in the mission that you have set us free to accomplish. So I guess I would just like to emphasize that. There's a lot of ways that can happen. Yep. Thank you, Anne. Um, one other hand came up here, um, and I'll just ask members if they have questions. Uh, we got about four minutes left. Um, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so uh, Christine mentioned a couple of times in her testimony and in uh, follow up that uh, you distribution utilities, electric utilities, have a lot of this poll data, and uh, it would be, you know, if they could be enticed to share that data. Uh, I was wondering whether um, that would be appropriate or applicable to the uh, 65,000 that uh, FX uh, was talking about uh, harvesting. Yep, uh, I'll answer. I, um, one of the things we've talked about at the CUD, the VCUD meeting is taking, finding out, and I've taken the task to actually go to that contact Vermont Public Power Supply Authority, contact uh, the utilities to find out what data they do have and identify that we are we are actually going to do that and try to figure out what existing data is available now that doesn't say the utilities will provide it for us but that does say that it's there and we probably shouldn't double collect it and then figure out a way to get it from the utilities but again we have to check part of my conversation will be checking the quality of that data as well and, and would that overlap with the um the full data that you that you want to uh, harvest through the methods you've been talking about. Yes, we don't, we don't want to do redundant. We don't want to have redundancy where it's not necessary. Okay. Um, would we have? I'm wondering if we would have to uh, specify in legislation that um, any poll data that utilities have should be made available to CUDs. I don't know, FX, I'll let you answer that, but it seems like a good idea to me, but. Yeah, that would be, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are, you know, we're certainly able to um, protect that data uh, under the trade secrets part of the uh, open meeting law. So I don't think that there should be any barrier to uh, that information being shared and it would actually, uh, it would actually unlock a lot of things. However, uh, just based on some conversations that I that I've had, I'm, uh, I would be concerned about, um, you know, how good it how good it is in terms of the needs of people who are designing the fiber to the premises network. So, yeah, but ultimately, if we got to see the data, we would know. Yeah, and ultimately, I would add that first of all. I don't even understand why this needs to be confidential. Um, you know, th so when we talk, the, the uh, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, defines what is uh, critical infrastructure. And most of our, you know, our distribution system, our di which is greater than 90% of our poles, is uh, non-critical infrastructure. So the, so the point is this public database could be very helpful to uh, anybody doing work and building new homes and develop. So I do think for we, our first goal should be to have it as public as possible. Now, that, you know, again, there may be something I don't understand, but certainly I've heard some people say, well, we got critical infrastructure issues. I want to clarify, no, that Velco is, is the utility that has some of the critical infrastructure and GMP has some, and we, we might have had one substation, but there just isn't that much critical infrastructure. Go ahead, Ann. Um, we've talked a lot about getting the information off the poles. 
But in terms of the question you posed uh, a little earlier, Tim, where you were looking for the sequence of events, the benchmarks that we have to go through to get from here to lighting up fiber everywhere, um, it isn't just getting the poll data. Um, it also is going to the steps of make ready on those polls, certificates of public good, and that whole step of process, all of which has to happen before we can drop the hammer on the next phase, which is basically design and engineering. Yeah, the answer, uh, just to piggyback what Ann's saying, I, you know, the poll data alone, although I think, you know, it's, it's debatable, but things are getting so accurate now with GPS that we could do a lot of pre-engineering without ever setting foot on a site. But that said, you know, the reason the poll data is improved is it, it cuts down on your pre-engineering costs. Will it totally eliminate that? Probably not, but, but then again, you know, I'm not familiar with this technology that FX is talking about. It sounds like it's pretty accurate. If you get down within a, you know, sub foot accuracy, you probably could do your pre-engineering without field visits. Thank you.